So, Lieutenant Colonel Hoisington spoke yesterday about the, the Sloan-funded project, so I won't be spending my time covering that. I'll take a step back and um, try to give a bigger picture of uh, the whole program and the, this idea of the hygiene hypothesis and how that could be relevant to psychiatric disorders. So I need to disclose, I have one disclosure. I'm on the Scientific Advisory Board for Modulon Therapeutics in London. They're in the business of developing uh, mycobacteria for therapeutic uses, including cancer. Uh, often I'll leave the acknowledgments till the end, but I thought I'd like to do this at the beginning because it's so important. Uh, in this case, first, uh, the funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge ONR for funding the MURI, uh, which was mentioned yesterday. The clinical trial that Lisa talked about is from VARR and Spire. Um, also funding with biofingerprinting from ISAFA, which we're very excited about. We have a $2 million grant to look at, from the state of Colorado, to look at the effects of smoke to marijuana in PTSD, treatment of PTSD, and that's ongoing. Um, and that, that money, $10 million, came from medical marijuana fees in the state of Colorado. Um, and then we have some funding from the medical campus at Anschutz, uh, looking at depression. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the people that are doing the work, including the Rocky Mountain Myrec, who we've mentioned. Teo Postolach is here in the back, if you can raise your hand. Um, and of course, the USAFA team. Uh, Christopher Stamper, if you can raise your hand, from CU Boulder is here. Uh, Odessa Gomez isn't here, but she's funded by the Sloan Foundation as a postdoc. I'll, me I'll mention her work later. And then, of course, the rest of the, the Sloan Foundation project team at U UT Austin, University of Chicago. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is the prevention, this idea of prevention of mental health disorders. Um, I'll then talk about the hygiene hypothesis, how that might be relevant, psychiatric disorders, as something that we call a failure of immunoregulation, and Dr. Brenner mentioned this yesterday. Um, immunoregulation, if you haven't heard that term, simply means a balanced expression of pro-inflammatory effector T cells on the one hand, like Th1, Th2, Th17 cells, and regulatory T cells on the other hand. Um, that's what we mean by immunoregulation. It's a balanced expression of those types of immune cells. And then I'll show some data where we can use a, a microbiome-based intervention, immunize with a single strain of bacterium, and prevent what we believe is a PTSD-like syndrome in, in rodent models. And then I'll, I'll end by talking about some future directions. So this is a quote from a paper by Tom Insel, who was then the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And they pointed out over a decade ago that in contrast to researchers in cancer and heart disease who sought cures and preventions, biological psychiatrists, psychiatrists in both academia and industry have set their sights on incremental and marketable advances, such as fewer adverse effects. Um, so, this was essentially a call for psychiatry to start thinking about ways that we can prevent psychiatric disorders from happening in the first place, as opposed to waiting until you have a psychiatric disorder, then bringing you into the clinic and trying to treat the disorder. Also related to this is part of the strategic vision of ONR, uh, specifically, this is from their uh, science and technology, naval uh, science and technology strategy, health and fit fitness optimization approaches that improve warfighter resilience to physical and psychological stressors is part of, part of the vision. So if we want to prevent, if we want to enhance resilience or, uh, to stressors, psychological stressors, physical stressors, or prevent stress-related psychiatric disorders like PTSD and uh, affective disorders like depression, how should we start? What, what, what should we be targeting? I'd argue that we need to think about risk factors for these different conditions. And many of these are known. These include genetic predisposition, which we are unlikely to be able to do much about in, in adults. There are environmental influences. Some of these uh, happen during early life, like adverse childhood experiences. But I would also argue that microbial inputs are important. And remember the, the story of the Amish and Hutterite uh, groups that Dr. Gilbert spoke about yesterday. 
And this includes pro-inflammatory micro microbial inputs. So many bacteria can be very potently inflammatory. Many of these are what are called gram-negative bacteria. They have a, a molecule on their cell wall that's called lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. This activates toll-like receptors on immune cells and promotes release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So there's no question that this is part of the story. But there are also immunoregulatory microbial inputs. And this is the side that people don't often think about. There are some bacteria that have co-evolved with humans over tens of thousands of years, and they've evolved a symbiotic relationship, or they've evolved some other type of relationship where inhibiting excessive inflammation is adaptive for these microbes. And us, we would argue. And then uh, if there's an imbalance, you have this failure of immunoregulation that leads to chronic low-grade inflammation or overt inflammation and disease. So this is all tied in with something called the hygiene hypothesis. So this is from a paper that we published in 2008. Uh, some psychiatric disorders in developed countries might be attributable to failure of immunoregulatory circuits to on terminate these ongoing inflammatory responses. So then the question is, how does all this work? So we, my colleague, Graham Rook, who's the first author here, he came up with the term old friends because this encapsulates this type of organism that we co-evolved with that performs these essential functions. And what they do is they bind to receptors on an immune cell, an innate immune cell called a dendritic cell. And by doing so, they promote differentiation of these cells into what are called regulatory dendritic cells. Regulatory DCs then bias the differentiation of T cells, our acquired immune system, uh, away from effector T cells that promote inflammation and toward regulatory T cells that release anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-10 and TGF-beta. Now, this can prevent inappropriate immune responses to self-antigens, food antigens in the gut, uh, our microbes, other microbes uh, in the microbiome, allergens, and it can also have what's called a bystander effect, where if you simply elevate the, the, the tone of anti-inflammatory cytokines, then this has a dampening effect on overall uh, inflammatory processes. So you may have heard that there's an epidemic of inflammatory disease in modern urban societies. And so this was published many years ago, just pointing out that there are many inflammatory conditions that are increasing at what we would consider alarming rates in the last 50 years. Um, and so this is showing increases in multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, and asthma. And it used, to, it used to be the case that people thought there might be a shift from Th1 to Th2 type immunity. But what Graham Rook and others are arguing now is it's simply a failure of immunoregulation because some of these diseases are mediated by Th2 type immune cells. Some are mediated by Th1 and Th17 cells. And it looks more like a global inability to suppress inappropriate inflammation, which is what you would expect if you, if you had a deficit or an impairment of uh, these regu immunoregulatory circuits. So I, I also really like this paper by Tom McDade published in 2012 because they went to a very rural area in lowland Ecuador. And the intention was to longitudinally measure biomarkers of inflammation in this rural population. And what they found is when the people came into the clinic and they were symptom free, they did not have infections, their CRP levels are very low. So keep in mind, the American Heart Association considers CRP levels, C-reactive protein, at a level of 3.0 milligram per liter to be the threshold for risk for cardiovascular disease. So all of these values at baseline are below what we would consider high risk for cardiovascular disease. But what you see is that without infection, people come in, they have very low levels. When they have infection, CRP goes up. This is the function of inflammation, is to fight pathogens. But it doesn't go up a lot. It only goes up to one. But in the US, males have levels that are higher than the levels you would expect to see during infection in someone li living in a rural uh, hunter-gatherer environment and females are even higher. So in essence, 
in urban conditions, many of us are walking around with chronic low-grade inflammation, and we believe that this is a risk factor, not only for inflammatory disease, but also for psychiatric dis disorders. So that's the next topic. This is just to point out uh, in a very simple way that autism, um, depression, and PTSD are all associated with very, very low regulatory T cells, consistent with this idea that there's a failure of immune regulation in these conditions. In autism, the children that had moderate symptoms had decreased regulatory T cells. The children that had severe autism had dramatically reduced uh, regulatory T cells. So in that, in that case, there was somewhat of a dose response. This slide also shows evidence for a fa failure of immune regulation, specifically in PTSD. Um, and what this group found is that individuals with PTSD were at higher risk for all autoimmune conditions. This suggests that there's a failure of the normal mechanisms that suppress inappropriate, inappropriate inflammation in response to self-antigens. Now, whether they get rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease probably depends on their genetic predisposition or other environmental factors, but the point is that all, all autoimmune conditions are elevated in PTSD uh, patients. This is also an interesting study. This was a study of nearly 3,000 Marines who were at boot camp. They took blood samples, measured C-reactive protein, which is one of the best markers of uh, chronic low-grade inflammation, and found that um, the level of CRP during boot camp predicted who subsequently developed PTSD symptoms after deployment. So having uh, elevated inflammatory markers prior to stress exposure, trauma exposure, or TBI, or other environmental exposures, chemical exposures, puts you at higher risk for uh, developing PTSD symptoms. So this idea that we could somehow intervene with that process, if it's really true that inflammation is a risk factor, this is a relatively simple factor. You could take several strategies. One, you could take aspirin. You could, which, but the problem with taking aspirin is that it only targets cyclooxygenase pathways. Inflammation is very complex. You have prostaglandins, you have um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, you have other inflammatory mediators like bradykine and et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. Many different inflammatory pathways. Some clinical trials have used cyclooxygenase inhibitors in depression. Others have used TNF antibodies to block t you know, one pro-inflammatory cytokine. There's some success with these strategies but it would be much better to use the body's own immunoregulatory circuits to intercept inflammation at a very upstream level. And that's, that would be at the level of the regulatory T cells. So there's a number of types of microorganisms that can induce this immunoregulatory response. And they, they are um, classed into three categories. The first are the, the commensals that exist in the human microbiome and have co-evolved with uh, humans. They have an advantage to persist in the host if they've developed the capacity to suppress inappropriate inflammation, particularly in macrophages that line the gastrointestinal tract. And in fact, all macrophages that line the, the gastrointestinal tract in, in the mucosa are anergic. That means that they cannot mount a pro-inflammatory response to a molecule like lipopolysaccharide. That's good, because there's lots of lipopolysaccharide right at the mucosal surface. And if those macrophages weren't anergic, you'd develop colitis and inflammation. Second category are chronic infections. And th this is a particular type of infection that um, was typical during the hunter-gatherer period of human evolution. This was a period where you had small bands of people um, on the plains of Africa, et cetera. Um, and the types of infections that were sec successful were infections that could persist in the host for long periods of time without A, sterilizing the host, or, or B, killing the host. Because then it, these infections could be transferred from one group of humans to another group of humans, even, on, even though they only met very infrequently. This includes things like Helicobacter pylori, uh, which we now know is immunoregulatory. It was discovered decades ago that it induced duodenal ulceration. 
um, and uh, inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. We've now nearly eradicated Helicobacter pylori in modern urban societies with modern medicine, antibiotics. And so we've eliminated what's potentially a keystone species in driving immunoregulation, uh, particularly during childhood. And then there's a third category, these uh, what are called pseudocommensals. So these were in, present in the water, the mud, the fermenting vegetable matter. And if you weren't drinking Perrier water or something else from a bottle, you'd, you'd be drinking milligram quantities of these types of organisms. We're finding in the Showerhead Microbiome Project that in fact our municipal water supplies on average across the United States, looking at 200 different sites, has 15% relative abundance of mycobacteria. So we're, we still have access to mycobacteria uh, through our water sources, through our showers, through our drinking water. Um, and these also seem to be important. So this slide is just to highlight the fact that, you know, uh, the gut microbiome, the first clad category of old friends, has potentially been dramatically altered in our modern urban existence. And so this is one of the PCOA plots. You saw many of these yesterday. And this was a study comparing uh, US citizens with people living in hunter-gatherer societies. And you can see that the highest alpha diversity, and we think of alpha diversity as being beneficial, high alpha diversity as being beneficial. The highest alpha diversity was in the Yanomami Indian tribe in the upper Amazon basin in Venezuela. And they have a very um, high vegetable intake in their diet, a very diverse diet, some crabs, some fish, etc. And they have the highest diversity of any population that's been studied so far. But you can see uh, who's at the bottom. That, that would be us. So uh, if we want to enhance immunoregulation through the microbiome, we have some work to do to increase uh, these measures. So the rest of the talk is going to be focused on mycobacterium vacui. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that mycobacterium vacui is unique in some way, that it, you know, this, this, this is just an example of an immunoregulatory old friend. So I would gather, I would propose there are hundreds of thousands of microorganisms that could do exactly the same thing that you're seeing, that you'll be seeing today. Um, the story behind this strain goes back to the 1970s when John Stanford and Graham Rook, were, who were immunologists, realized that the, the uh, success of vaccination programs against leprosy very dramatically depending on where um, the trials were being conducted. So they went to an area around Lake Kyoga in Uganda where the vaccines were very successful with the idea of trying to identify an environmental factor that could explain the success of these vaccinations. When they got there, they found that the shores of the, the lake were lined with this orange slime, and this orange slime turned out to be Mycobacterium vacui. Uh, they reasoned that because Mycobacterium vacui is closely related to Mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy, it was act they, they share many antigens, it was acting as an adjuvant to boost the efficacy of the vaccine. They then learned that it had these immunoregulatory properties to induce regulatory T cells, anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin 10 and TGF beta. And then in a Nature Medicine paper, they showed that they could prevent allergic asthma simply by injecting a heat killed preparation of the bacterium. So often people talk about the bacteria that are in dust. And they say, oh, 99% of it's dead. It's been there so long, right? But for us, it doesn't matter. <laughs> dead bacteria are really uh, bioactive antigens, they've evolved to uh, mod modulate our immune system, and they don't have to be alive to do that. It's also potential that they have small molecules that persist after death that can mediate some of the effects that you'll be seeing. So the model that we're using, we, we believe, is, is a model that has some validity as a model of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a model of chronic uh, subordination in mice. Um, it's called the chronic uh, subordinate colony housing model. And it was developed by Stefan Reber and, and his colleagues, Inge Newman, at University of Regensburg in, in Germany. And I won't go into the, the background about why we believe this is a good model, uh, but I'll show, I will show you some of the, some of the, um, the basics of the model and, and the physiological outcomes. <clears throat> 
So the model essentially involves taking four smaller mice and, and co-housing them with a larger dominant mouse. And mice are social species and they have stereotyped dominant aggressive relationships where there's one dominant male in, a, in the cage. And so if you group house mice that are not siblings, they will spontaneously establish these hierarchies. There'll be one mouse that's dominant. In this case, we're biasing the outcomes because the, we have one mouse that's bigger. It's bred to be more aggressive. It always wins. Uh, mice that uh, show subordination have stereotype behaviors like an upright submissive posture. They stand up and freeze. That's a signal to the dominant that they're subordinate and you don't need to attack me or bite me. And that's adaptive because that means they don't get injured. And this is just daily life in the, the life of mice. Um, and so what we're doing, we thought, we know that when regulatory T cells differentiate, they, their half-life is 27 days. So you can give a single stimulus, induce these regulatory T cells, and the half-life is 27 days. So we do that three times. 27 days, 27 days, 27 days, and then we set up this long-term immunoregulation with immunization. So we either have mycobacterium vacui or vehicle, then they have this 19-day chronic subordinate colony exposure, and then we do behavioral measures and physiological outcomes at the end. And so what we know from this model is uh, you see classic effects of chronic stress. There's adrenal hypertrophy, uh, glucocorticoid insensitivity, these are typical responses that you would see during chronic stress, and also increased anxiety, and this is measured by a number of different behavioral tests that are common in rodents, uh, but also indices of somatic disorders, including uh, spontaneous colitis, stress-induced colitis, uh, risk for inflammation-related colon cancer, and increased or exaggerated chemically-induced colitis in a model of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. One of the things that we thought when we did this first study is we should videotape the aggressive encounters because what if somehow the immunization made the subordinate, little subordinate mice dominant? Then it kind of undermines the whole paradigm. So we videotaped the first hour, we videotaped an hour in the afternoon, and then there's a new do they're moved to the cage of a new dominant male on day eight and day 15. We videotaped those interactions. And what we found was really interesting. They were always subordinate. So the dominant male always defeated the subordinate mice. But it, if they'd been immunized, they adopted a different strategy in the first hour in their encounters with the dominant. Specifically, they showed less of this subordinate behavior. And we consider that a shift toward a more proactive emotional coping response to a stressor. We also know that a passive or submissive response to trauma puts you at higher risk for PTSD. So this may be in some way related to uh, outcomes, uh, although we don't understand the mechanisms that are involved here. One of the things that we did was looked at the gut microbiome. And just as is seen in other models of stress, alpha diversity went down. That's essentially the number of different species in the gut microbiome. Beta diversity looks like an expanding universe of microbial communities. That just tells you that after stress, individuals are responding, the gut microbiomes are responding, but they're responding in completely different ways, almost in a stochastic uh, manner. And so there's no way to predict at this level how an individual will respond in terms of changes in the microbial community. And that's also seen with stressors. But there was one um, phenotype change in the taxonomy that was clearly visible. And you could see that in the last two bars. Over here on the right are the, the animals that were supposed to the chronic subordinate colony housing. These are the single house controls on the left. And you could see on the last two days, day eight and 15, there's a massive upregulation of proteobacteria. And we think this is significant because these are the gram-negative LPS-containing bacteria with, with great potential for inflammation. And more importantly, the main driver of this increase in proteobacteria was a log orders of magnitude increases in helicobacter. 
Remember, helicobacter during development can be immunoregulatory, but if you don't have good immunoregulation, this bacterium implants onto the epithelial cells. Some strains inject proteins into epithelial cells to modify the host. And we know that if you don't have good immunoregulation, the immune system doesn't tolerate helicobacter, and it attacks. If you're attacking a bacterium that's part of your co-evolved microbiome that happens to be attached to you, it's like a parasite, you're going to damage your own tissue. And this is, in fact, what we find, is that the abundance of proteobacteria, the abundance of helicobacter correlates with the amount of colitis in the vehicle-treated animals. What was exciting, though, is although vehicle-treated animals show this large increase in histological damage to the colon, that's prevented if the mice have been immunized. They don't get colitis. They still have an increase in helicobacter. It's just that they're tolerating helicobacter. They don't care. Humans have co-evolved with helicobacter pylori for at least 66,000 years since the migration out of East Africa. You should toler tolerate helicobacter. But if you don't have good immune regulation, you don't. That's when the problem occurs. So you can see there's other increases. So this is before stress. This is after stress. Immunization doesn't really change that, blue and red. But you can see this increase in yellow, which is the proteobacteria, the LPS-positive bacteria. This is uh, the model of inflammatory bowel disease. So it's DSS-induced colitis. It's a chemical that induces a colitis that is uh, believed to be a good model of IBD. And here you can see vehicle-treated animals have an exaggeration of DSS-induced colitis, and that's prevented, again, by uh, the immunization. And we also looked at um, cytokines from mesenteric lymph node cells. So during stress, the, the gut barrier breaks down, bacteria can translocate into the body, they end up in mesenteric lymph node cells, and there's lots of immune activity there. And you can see that with stress, there's an increase in interferon gamma, a type 1 cytokine, a massive increase in IL-6, uh, and both of those are prevented by the immunization. So the immunization is preventing the DSS-induced colitis inflammatory response uh, in the mesenteric lymph node cells. And notice that there's a massive increase in IL-10 now, an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So they're still responding. They're just responding with an anti-inflammatory bias as opposed to a pro-inflammatory response. So what are we, what are we gonna do next? Um, we're excited about a number of future directions. We're very interested in the possibilities. So everything I showed you so far is peripheral inflammation. But can this immunization approach also prevent neuroinflammation? And so the brain's resident uh, macrophages are called microglia. And we know from work of other groups that the microbiome controls the micro, microglia phenotype in the brain. So germ-free animals have massively abnormal microglia. And you can restore the microglia to normal simply by putting in uh, a complex microbiome. So the microbiome is controlling the microglia in the brain. If I knew how that happened, uh, I'd have many more NIH grants. I can't tell you how it happens. I can't tell you it happens. It's a big black box. We want to know. The other thing to point out that microglia can become primed. And when microglia become primed, they respond to an inflammatory stimulus or a stressor with an exaggerated pro-inflammatory cytokine release that can be visualized, for example, by measuring interleukin-1 beta pro-inflammatory cytokine. This is called microglial priming. We know this impairs cognition, impairs performance. Uh, so microglial, microglial priming can be bad. And we think that this priming is involved in increased risk of mental illness. Um, this is part of a study that's part of the MURI program. We're just measuring core body temperature during chronic circadian disruption. And you can see that with chronic circadian disruption, um, we've altered their light cycle from uh, light dark to dark, dark light. And then the animals in uh, bright blue and red have to realign with the new light cycle. The other animals are normal light cycle continuously. So we consider this a first hit, um, a stressor 
Then they're exposed to a second hit, which is social defeat, and then we're looking at cognitive behavior. This is, this is how we're t trying to approach this idea of the two-hit hypothesis of vulnerability to stressors. This is to point out that systemic inflammatory events really do matter when it comes to uh, performance that's dependent on brain function and microglial activity. And so here, they have an ME7 model in mice, which is a, a model of prion disease. So it's a brain uh, inflammatory condition. But having a, a systemic immune event, simply an injection of poly-IC, which mimics viruses, can cause massive impairment in motor function. And this is dramatically accelerated in animals that have this uh, neuroinflammation ongoing. This is a, a study, that, a collaboration that we started with Steve Mayer at University of Colorado Boulder. And they have something called learned helplessness, where rats are uh, stressed with inescapable uh, stress, and then 24 hours later, they're tested for anxiety. And what you see is a decrease in the amount of time that they spend interacting with a juvenile male, and that's considered an anxiety-like response. And that anxiety response, 24 hours after the stressor, was prevented by immunization with Mycobacterium bacchi. But most importantly, we know that inescapable stress causes microglial priming 24 hours later. So if we take the microglia out of the hippocampus, isolate them, and then expose them in a dose response way to lipopolysaccharide, you see there's a dose response to li lipopolysaccharide. In animals that have been stressed have micro primed microglia. They respond with a greater increase in uh, interleukin-1 beta expression, which is shown here. Animals that have been immunized don't have the stress-induced microglial priming. So it's preventing a stress-induced priming and stress-induced neuroinflammation in the brain after a single stressor 24 hours later. I'd also like to mention that we're doing screening to identify novel molecules from Mycobacterium bacchi that can recapitulate the anti-inflammatory effects. So we use cell-based cell assays, look, look for extracts of Mbaki that have anti-inflammatory effects, and then test them in other models. And we've identified uh, a molecule from Mycobacterium bacchi that is a lipid, it's a triacylglycerol molecule. Mycobacteria sequester triacylglycerols in vesicles inside the bacterium. They get engulfed by macrophages or dendritic cells. They release these lipids into the cytoplasm of the host cell and we found that they're binding to a receptor in the macrophage, which is a transcription factor that shuts off NF-kappa B and the entire inflammatory cascade. So it's making the macrophages anergic, and this allows mycobacteria to be intracellular parasites and persist inside macrophages and dendritic cells. Other bacteria can do this too, like salmonella. Um, mycobacteria are not the only ones. But the but the, the lipid is unique. The only other mention of the lipid that we've identified was uh, identified in 1962 uh, by a biochemistry lab in another mycobacterium species. So it looks like no other genera can make this lipid, uh, at least using the methods that have been applied to date. So this is uh, our postdoc fellow, uh, Odessa Gomez, and she's developing a model using an aerosol chamber to aerosolize Mycobacterium vacui, like you would get in your own shower at home. And so it's going to be uh, in water, it's going to be aerosolized into very, very tiny droplets, which are then inhaled, just like you would do in a shower. And then we'll be looking for uh, outcomes like allergy and anxiety and mechanisms. This is to point out that we've started doing microbiome studies in PTSD subjects. This was a study in collaboration with Sean Hemmings in South Africa. Um, very high uh, rates of violence in South Africa, mainly physical assault, uh, assault with a weapon, uh, sexual assault. And we had two groups. You may know that not everyone that is exposed to trauma goes on to develop PTSD. In fact, there's a very small minority that do. 
And so we're asking, is there a difference between people that have had trauma and get PTSD and those that have had trauma and don't? And we did see a pattern. And the pattern was that people that had low actinobacteria, and mycobacterium is an actinobacterium species, they're gram positive, so they don't have LPS. Many of them are immunoregulatory. They're environmental, typically. They come from the environment. But also Veruca microbia, which is also environmental, water, mud, soil, and Lentisferae, which is a sister species of Veruca microbia. So it looks like people that have low abundance of these immunoregulatory bacteria, in a broad sense, the gram-positive species may have some protection. So to conclude, uh, exposure to these immunoregulatory old friends that we're very fond of has declined dramatically in the last 50 years. Psychiatric disorders are associated with a failure of immunoregulation, certainly decreased regulatory T cells. We can immunize with one strain of an immunoregulatory bacterium that's dead and protect and restore immunoregulation and protect against inflammation, anxiety, and fear. And we might consider similar strategies for both promoting stress resilience and performance and cognitive function, uh, but also resilience to psychiatric disorders.